this is Jim Bush. Uh, thanks for listening in to today's webinar. Uh, today we're going to discuss relative strength. And we have uh, a lot to cover, so I'll try and move quickly through the slides. Uh, right off the bat, uh, what I'd like to say is if you have any questions over the course of the presentation, uh, there's a chat box on your screen there. So you can submit questions at any time. And then during the Q&A portion, I'll get to them. So what we'll be covering today is um, what is relative strength? How is it calculated? Uh, why technical traders should use relative strength, why fundamental investors should use relative strength, and probably what I consider to be sort of the meat of the presentation is how to interpret relative strength in various markets. Um, and then at the very end, we'll have a Q&A section. Hopefully, we'll have a good amount of time for that. So if you're not familiar with me, I'm a senior managing analyst at briefing.com. been here for about 12 years or so. Um, Personally, I'm a growth stock investor. I use a hybrid fundamental and technical approach. Uh, I created the emerging growth, liquid momentum, and value leaders systems, and I manage the teams uh, that produce that content. I post commentary under the growth trader uh, handle. The ticker for that is SetupX. I also publish commentary under the emerging growth and uh, the next big thing which is our IPO commentary. So let's just jump right into it. So what is relative strength? Um, relative strength measures the extent to which a security outperforms its universe over a given time period. Um, this universe can be anything. In other words, you can compare a stock to all stocks, for example. Uh, you can compare a stock to the S&P 500, or you could compare it to another stock. Um, it's just the stock relative to another security. So here at Briefing, we use six-month relative strength, and I use the all stocks universe. So whenever I put out a relative strength rank, it's comparing a stock with every other U.S. listed stock. Uh, relative strength is typically expressed as a percentage rank uh, from 1 to 100, with 100 being the strongest and 1 the weakest. The fifth, uh, 50 is sort of the midpoint, where stocks that are above 50 are showing relative strength, and stocks with values below 50 are showing relative weakness. And as a final point, too, there's sort of a common misconception. Uh, relative strength is not the same thing as the relative strength index, or RSI indicator. So if you have a charting package and you're looking for a way to track or plot relative strength. Um, RSI is not the same thing. Um, basically, again, relative strength compares a stock to another security or to a universe of securities. And the RSI indicator compares a stock's recent price history with its own price history in the past during a given time period. So they're very different things. So I just wanted to make sure I established that. And again, here at Briefing, we have three proprietary systems at the InPlay Plus level that use relative strength. And again, we use six-month relative strength. Emerging growth stocks, as the name implies, uh, that produces a list of small and mid-cap growth stocks with high relative strength ranks. Liquid momentum is our swing trading system. And value leaders, uh, as the name implies, it's a value system that also has a relative strength component. Basically, it, it, the relative strength component is there to make sure that you don't catch uh, or don't get caught in any value traps. So how is relative strength calculated? The, tradition, the traditional calculation for relative strength is the percentage change between the current price and the price at the beginning of the period. Um, so in other words, you're comparing the difference or the percentage difference between the current price and, you know, we use six months relative strength, so it would be the price six months ago. Um, I personally think the traditional calculation is problematic, and that's mostly because what you would see is relative strength, uh, relative strength ranks that fluctuate dramatically week to week 
if the price action at the beginning of the period was very volatile. Um, we used the traditional calculation at first when we started running emerging growth. And what we found is we had some really odd additions where um, a new name would suddenly show up with a really high relative strength rank, say 99. And we look at the stock and stock hadn't really moved that much. And so we would look back at the chart and sure enough, six months ago, there was say a big gap down, which all of a sudden created this big percentage difference between the two. And then maybe two weeks later, the stock would drop off because in the six month ago price, the stock had recovered. So even though the current price change wasn't really that dramatic, it wasn't really doing much, it was, the relative strength rank was getting moved, was very volatile because of what was happening in the six month ago period. So that, that prompted me to do some research and come up with an alternative formula. And what we use now is more of a smoothed calculation and you calculate it by taking the current price and dividing it by the current value of the 26-week simple moving average. So basically what you're doing is um, you're just calculating the distance between the price and its moving average. And then you're ranking all the stocks you know, from highest to lowest in terms of how far away they are from the moving average. So, in my opinion, this calculation is much better because it really smooths out the volatility in the denominator, which is the beginning of the period, in other words, six months ago, and reflects only the volatility in the current price action, which is really what you want to focus on anyway. So that's something that um, I won't say it's unique to briefing.com because I got, I got this uh, calculation from a couple of other studies that were published, so I'm not the only person using it, but it's not the traditional one. So in terms of the technical side of how you interpret relative strength, stocks with very high relative strength ranks, say 90 or above, are by definition the market leaders. And there have been a number of statistical studies uh, published that have shown that basically high relative strength stocks have a strong tendency to outperform over the next three to six months and low relative strength stocks have a strong tendency to underperform over the next three to six months. Again, I'm talking about six month relative strength here. So, and these studies are pretty consistent on that score as well. And I'm just gonna quote one of them. This is an author that I like quite a bit. It's Charles Kirkpatrick. He's published a number of books. One of his books, Beat the Market, is basically all about his statistical studies of relative strength. So I would recommend it if you're interested in that subject. But his conclusion is that relative price strength seems to breed more relative price strength and relative weakness breeds further relative weakness. This implies that you are better off buying a stock that is trading at its high than buying one that is trading at its low, contrary to the human natural bias towards a bargain. This probably sounds, for those of you who follow William O'Neill and uh, IBD, uh, this sounds, I'm sure, very familiar to you. But what's interesting, you know, if you, if you read the book, he really backs it up with the numbers, and it's really um, very eye-opening. And the beauty of rel relative strength as a technical indicator is that it works very well on multiple time frames. So whether you're day trading, swing trading, or uh, investing, um, it's applicable to all those different time frames. In general terms, technicians want to be trading high relative strength stocks on the long side and low relative strength stocks on the short side. I'll put it another way. It's very dangerous to short a high relative strength stock um, if you're not a very experienced trader. And you increase the odds of buying into a value trap if you buy a low relative strength stock or one that's showing relative weakness. And I underlined the very dangerous part of shorting a high relative strength stock because they see it all the time where say say Tesla recently or uh, Taser or Tzu back in their heydays or Netflix you'll hear all the you know the stock goes on a, a huge run and you'll hear people saying you know whether in the chat rooms or the message boards or wherever 
oh, I'm shorting the stock, it's up way too much, or it's way overvalued. And guess what? You know, all those people turned into roadkill. Because you just, unless you're a very experienced trader, you do not want to short a high relative strength stock. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. No need to belabor that point. Now moving on to a fundamental interpretation of relative strength, this is kind of the side that I find the most interesting. Um, I know that the term relative strength can sometimes have negative connotations for uh, fundamental investors, and you often might hear, oh, it's just chasing momentum stocks or that type of comment. Um, I think this is a mistake because Relative strength can be a very useful tool for investors to find under the radar names with improving or accelerating fundamentals. Um, and this is because, I mean, I, I think it's stating the obvious if you've been in the market for more than a few months that stocks are leading indicators. And the current price action reflects expectations looking out, say, three to six months or even longer. So when you see a stock that has sustained outperformance, or even better, is just beginning to outperform. These are the stocks that market participants sort of collectively judge have the strongest fundamental catalysts ahead. Um, another way of putting that is it's a good bet that when you come upon a stock that has our high relative strength rank, that good things are happening at that company. That's probably the simplest way of putting it. Um, but there's one big caveat there a big, big thing. It's crucial that when making this assumption, you confirm that the company in question is a real business with identifiable fundamental catalysts. And that's opposed to a stock that gets caught up in some kind of day trading theme. So for example, you see two stocks that have a relative strength rank of 99. You take a look at the first one, you see it's just broken out. Uh, then you take a look at the business and you'll see that uh, it's a real business you know, accelerating revenues, they're just turning profitable, they have a product that's selling real well. I mean, as a fundamental investor, that tells you, if you've never heard of this name before, you need to take a closer look at that one. Uh, the second stock that has a relative strength rank of 99, it's been trading between a dollar and dollar fifty for the last three years, 10,000 shares a day. Um, some guy got on a message board and called it, I don't know, the next Tesla or the next Netflix or something like that. And it went from a buck fifty to five. Now that one, of course, is going to show up on a relative strength uh, screen as very high relative strength given that percentage move. But it's you look at it and it's not a real business. Um, you know they have no operating revenues. It's a shell company, whatever the case is. Um, that's just kind of a day trading type of vehicle that's probably just going to come right back down to where it was before. You know soon after. So it's crucial that you make that distinction. Now, this is actually a topic that I discussed quite a bit in my previous uh, webinar, how to uncover the next generation of leading stocks back in June. Um, I went into the whole concept of story stocks, uh, high relative strength stocks that have really compelling growth stories. And uh, so if you're interested in listening further to that concept and how I sort of break that down, um, you, you can find the links to all of my webinars on the Emerging Growth page. Uh, in the Monday uh, edition where the updated rankings are published. So let's get into the part about how to interpret relative strength during various market conditions. So let's start with the bull market. So in a bull market, you'll want to look for stocks with superior relative strength. In other words, the true market leaders. Um, as a rule of thumb, these leaders should have a relative strength greater than 90 um, in all likelihood, it'll probably be 97, 98, 99, 100. Then you'll want to look at the weekly charts to determine the pattern and the duration of the stock's outperformance. And just as a general rule, any, any stock in a bull market that has a relative strength rank of, say, 97 or 100 is going to look overextended. There's just no two ways about it. I mean, that just comes with the territory. So when you're looking at a market leader uh, for the first time, an investor should ask themselves the following questions. How would I characterize the weekly chart? For example, has it been in a very clearly defined uptrend or up channel for a year or more? Um, 
has it just broken out from a long-term base? Basically, you need to get a sense of how the stock has been, what the history of that stock has been. Um, in other words, it has a really high relative strength rank now, but sort of where did it come from? Then you need to ask yourself, how long ago did the initial fundamental catalyst occur? And this is really a crucial point right here, because once you've answered the first two questions there, then it sort of leads to the final question, which is, can I accurately call this an early stage idea? And I'll show you some examples of what I'm talking about that should sort of explain what I'm, what I'm getting at here. Let's start with lumber liquidators, for example. This is the weekly chart of lumber liquidators. This has been a stock that's on the emerging growth rankings for two years or so, on and off for about two years, maybe. So this is the current chart. If you look at it, it's trading above 100 right now. How do you characterize the chart? Well, it's been a really clear uptrend for about two years now. Uh, really sort of a picture-perfect uptrend. Uh, if you look at the numbers, it has a relative strength rank above 90. I think currently it's about 95 or so. And is this a real company? Well, yeah, I mean, they have very good growth characteristics. EPS uh, in the latest quarter was up 70%. Revenues were up 22%, which is pretty good for a retailer. Uh, it's still a small cap company, so it's not it's not very, very well known. It's not a household name, that's for sure. But when I look at this and I ask myself, is this an early stage idea? I would say probably not. I mean, this is, it's been running for two years already. It's quintupled in price over that period. And even if I really like the fundamental story this, and it's a clearly a market leader, I mean, this might be a better swing trading vehicle given that clear uh, uptrend, say, than investment. I, I can't look at this and say, well, I'll be get, if I choose to buy it, I'll be getting in, in the early part of the move as opposed to the middle or the end of the move. So then what I do is I ask myself, all right, well, so when did this move start? And I isolated that. In my opinion, it started with the breakout in April of 2012, which I have marked here. And, well, sure, it would have been better to get into lumber liquidators back in April than it would be now. That's when it's trading in the 20s. But what were the characteristics of that stock back in April? Would that have popped up on my relative strength screen? And it turns out that, yeah, it would have. So, for example, in April 2010, lumber liquidators had a relative strength rank of 97. It had very good growth characteristics, as you can see there. Um, that market cap number isn't correct, by the way. It was much smaller. It's probably closer to 200 million or so. Um, the chart itself is a little on the noisy side, but it's clearly that, if I remember correctly, that, that surge to new highs back there was based on an earnings report. And clearly you have a big move higher, a big breakout based on a fundamental catalyst that's starting to clear that resistance. To me, I would look at this when this popped up on the emerging growth screen, which it did back then. I would look at this as a really interesting early stage idea, and I would really take a I would really dig into this one and take a closer look at it. Um, so that's what I mean in terms of evaluating sort of the duration of the move and whether you could characterize it. Even though you know lumber liquidators back then had an RS rank of 97, and today it has an RS rank of 95 or so, there's a huge difference in terms of how the chart looks and whether it's a potential investment or a better swing trading idea. Let's take a look at another uh, similar situation, too. This is another name from the emerging growth list. In fact, the chart looks very similar to lumber liquidators, so I won't spend too much time evaluating it. Uh, currently, as of August, you know, it's come in quite a bit now, but looking at it when it was kind of peaking back in August, it had a relative strength rank in the high 90s, fantastic growth characteristics, about 1.6 billion market cap, approaching sort of mid-cap territory, but certainly not a household name, that's for sure. But again, given the duration of that run, almost two years, uh, that might fall into more the swing trading candidate category than an investment 
candidate category. So again, we look back when the move started. Would this have shown up on our relative strength screens as a market leader? Actually, it would have. So you look at the RS rank of Santeris back in January 2012. It had a RS rank of 99 and fantastic growth characteristics then as it does now in a market cap of 276 million. It was a single digit stock, which increases the risk, that's for sure, back then. But this would absolutely, I mean, given that RS rank of 99 and the strong fundamentals there as it broke out, again, if I remember correctly, that was, uh, I think it was based on a news item, not an earnings report. But this would absolutely qualify as an early stage idea. Um, and in fact, this did pop up on the emerging growth ranking that week. So this chart actually reflects when it was added to the emerging growth rankings. So just to summarize the key points here, if relative strength is, if rel, excuse me, if relative strength is greater than 90 and the stock has been rising in a well-defined uptrend or has already seen a powerful breakout, it's a pretty good bet that the key catalyst has already occurred. And then it's up to you to identify that catalyst and make an informed guess as to whether it's an early stage idea. In other words, it might make for a good investment position. Or whether it's a bit played out and might be better off in the swing trading category. And for me personally, just as a generalization, a stock with a 90, with a relative strength rank of 90 or above that has just broken out of a long-term base is much more interesting to me than one that's been running for one to two years and has sort of that picture-perfect uptrend. Because um, generally, I'm looking for new ideas or early stage ideas. So another type of idea that I'm always looking for in a bull market are basically those potential future leaders. In other words, they don't have the relative strength ranks of 99. Um, they haven't been running for a long time. They don't have great uptrends. But they have the characteristics of a stock that could be a future leader. And the way I look for these is I basically screen for a relative strength rank greater than 50. So at the bare minimum, they need to be outperforming the mean. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, very high. I mean, some of these can be relative strength rank of 55 or 60. Um, well, what I'm looking for is a weekly chart that shows a broad sideways pattern for a year or more. Um, more recently, the stock should show a clear consolidation pattern just under the range highs. And if basically, if the chart looks like what I'm looking for, the relative strength rank shows it's at least outperforming the mean in the fundamentals checkout, then it becomes one of my watch list names. Um, and when you show one of the, uh, when you see one of those, again, you should ask yourself a series of questions. Uh, does the weekly chart show a broad sideways pattern? In other words, have this stock, has this stock been pretty much kind of marking time? And what is the potential catalyst that investors are waiting for? Um, another way of putting it is what's been keeping a lid on the stock? It hasn't been going down, so the fundamentals aren't deteriorating. It's just been moving sideways for an extended period of time, so clearly, it's just sort of in wait and see mode. Wait and see mode. Investors are waiting for something, and the fact that it's bumping up against the upper end of the range suggests that uh, investors think that that catalyst might be coming up. And then finally, once I sort of once I decide I like the chart, I look at the fundamentals, and the fundamentals look good. Is this a high conviction fundamental idea, or does it sort of more fall into the category of a technical idea? Um, that, that's a crucial distinction to make right there. So let's just look at an example here. Um, Infoblox is a name that I've been, I was posting on a lot back in the spring. Uh, this is a chart that I posted back in April of this year. Uh, this is, this again is kind of a noisy chart, but it shows basically just a broad sideways trading pattern. And at the time, in April, had a relative strength rank of 86, which is pretty good for a stock that's been moving sideways. Uh, good growth characteristics, uh, market cap that still puts it in sort of small cap territory, 
uh, definitely wasn't a name you were hearing about a lot at the time. And for me, once I looked into it, as you could probably tell from the comments I posted back on the page then, this became a really high conviction idea. And even though the stock was noisy and sort of prone to whipsaws, everything about the story suggested it was going higher, but investors were really just waiting for that catalyst to come around. Um, here is what the stock eventually did. As you can see, uh, it had it, it, it attempted to break out, had a nasty shakeout, and then and the shakeout occurred right before the real breakout. Um, and this chart actually is kind of painful for me to look at because guess who was shaken out <laughs> right before the real move higher? Um, I was. So even despite my very high conviction in this stock, um, you have to set your risk parameters, and unfortunately this one knocked me out right before it started going higher. Imperva is another name that I was talking about quite a bit back in the spring. This is back in May. I posted this chart several times. Uh, again, by now these characteristics should be familiar. Sideways pattern on a weekly chart, bumping up against the upper range of it, waiting for a catalyst. If you look at the numbers, uh, relative strength was really mediocre, 64. Uh, the fundamental, the numbers were kind of mixed. EPS declined 8%. Revenues were, revenue growth was good. But once you looked into the story, there was, it was explainable. It wasn't a demand issue. It was based on the timing of investments. So this was definitely a potential future leader that I had a lot of conviction in. And this one went on to do quite well. Um, of course, that also had an attempted breakout, a shakeout, and then the run higher. So here's one more example of this. Uh, solar winds. This is a chart that I posted back in um, May of 2011. It's a very similar pattern. Again, this one's a little bit more on the noisy side, but it's clear. It's bumping up against the upper end of that multi-year range. Relative strength, relative strength was pretty good at 81. Good growth characteristics. Not a household name at the time, that's for sure. So this one is, was very much a roller coaster, though. Broke out soon after I posted that chart. Had a couple of shakeouts. And then uh, earnings came around and just launched this one higher. Um, this one would have taken a lot of patience to stay with, but this turned into a real mover in 2012. Here's a current example that I, I sort of debated whether to put this in the webinar today. Uh, basically, I, people would probably say, well, those past examples are great, but what are you looking at now? What fits these criteria? Uh, Globus Medical has the chart pattern. That's for sure. It's, it's actually a really nice chart pattern. But the numbers themselves are so-so. Relative strength, 51, so barely uh, above the mean. The growth characteristics are mediocre. It's kind of a slow-growing industry. They do spinal um, uh, medical, medical equipment for spinal treatments. They're growing faster than their peers, but it's still sort of a slower growth industry. But so again, I was borderline input about putting this one in, but here's a current example of what what I'm uh, talking about. So just to summarize the key points, if relative strength is in the neighborhood of 50 to 80, and the stock is consolidating in the upper end of a multi-year range, then it's a good bet that the fundamentals are okay but the key catalyst has yet to occur. Um, it's also not unusual for these stocks to experience a failed breakout or stop, stop flush before the big run. And when you see a bullish multi-year consolidation combined with solid growth characteristics, that name should remain at the top of your watch list, in my opinion. So when... I, in my opinion, relative strength really shines as an indicator during bear markets, even more so than, than they do in bull markets. I really like to use relative strength during bear markets or during extended market corrections. So during an extended correction or a bear market, investors should populate their watch list with just the leaders. In other words, stocks that have relative strength ranks 90 or above. Uh, the weekly chart 
may show a rally, but in a bear market, superior relative strength will often appear as a sideways consolidation just under the highs. So even though the stock is moving sideways, that's showing enormous strength if the market is falling apart around it. And I would suggest that in a bear market, just ignore stocks with a relative strength rank below 80. Simply because they're not sending a clear signal to you. If it's a bear market and a stock has a relative strength rank of 99, that's sending a clear signal that this is a leader, that you know funds are, are not selling this stock. A stock that has a relative strength ranking of 60 or 70 isn't really telling you much. It's holding up, but not anything to get really interested in. And the key concept here is that the small number of stocks that refuse to sell off during a correction or bear market are those that institutions believe have the best prospects once the correction runs its course. And I actually did an entire webinar on just this subject. Uh, this was back in April of this year, how to spot winning growth stocks in difficult markets. If you're interested in that, again, uh, the link you can find it in, in the Monday rankings report for emerging growth, published every Monday. So here are a couple examples that are actually taken from that webinar. So if you already uh, listened to that webinar, just bear with me. These will look familiar to you. So Mellanox, back in 2012, as you can see, they had a huge breakout on based on an earnings report, essentially right before the market rolled over in May. So you can see in the lower part of that chart, the line chart, that's the S&P 500. And this blue line here just shows the extent of the sell-off in the S&P 500. It was a pretty dramatic sell-off. But what did Mellanox do? Sure, it pulled off its, its high, but it moved in a very tight range um, in just a very clear lateral consolidation. And that showed enormous relative strength at the time Mellanox had a 99 relative strength rank. So this was outperforming just about everything in the market as it moved sideways. And also its growth characteristics were great too. Triple digit EPS growth, uh, very strong revenue growth. Um, and just one point on this one as well. If you see a really clear range like this, if you see sort of a brief shakeout attempt that takes the stock below the range, flushes out a lot of people, and then gets immediately bid right back up into that range, that's basically a buy signal. Um, you know, unless the market completely falls apart, this is going to be the first stock to break out once that correction runs its course. Another chart I used from that presentation, actually pretty much every presentation that I've done on relative strength, uh, again, bear with me if you've already seen this one, this is an older chart of Isilon. This one doesn't trade anymore because it was acquired by EMC. But the blue line here is the NASDAQ composite. And this shows what happened during the flash crash back in 2010, I believe. Uh, the NASDAQ crashed from May right through the summer into August. But what did Isilon do? As the NASDAQ was crashing, Isilon traded in a very tight range between 12 and probably about 14.50. And any stock that trades in that tight of a range right at its 52-week highs while the market is falling apart all around it, had a relative strength rank of 98, uh, triple-digit EPS growth, very strong revenue growth, not a household name, not well known, uh, that's basically a buy signal. This is going to be, sure enough, the, one of the first stocks to break out once the correction. Actually, it didn't even wait for the correction to run its course. The market was still correcting when this one broke out. But if there's one takeaway in terms of how to use relative strength during a bear market, the Isilon chart sums it up, which is why I include it in almost every presentation I do. Key points. Again, superior relative strength during an extended correction or bear market is a clear technical signal that the stock in question will be among the crop of new leaders once the correction ends. So I, I want to tie this back again in with a fundamental angle too. Especially during a weak market, the fundamental investors, I would suggest, should pay particular attention to relative strength. 
any stock that's showing superior relative strength during a correction, good things are happening at that company. Institutions refuse to sell it while the market is coming in, and they're even buying it on very minor dips right near the 52-week highs. So basically they're accumulating it while they're unloading probably many of their other positions. They basically want to have a full position by the time the correction is over because they know this thing is going to run. So again, for fundamental investors, I think that's a, a key point here. Here is kind of a miscellaneous section that I'll just go over very quickly. Um, assuming a relative strength rank meets your criteria, uh, like I said before, the weekly chart, uh, determine what the pattern is for the weekly chart. Is it an uptrend? Is it in a consolidation or just emerging from a consolidation? If the weekly chart has no identifiable pattern, just avoid the stock. And here are a couple examples. Abiomed uh, every now and then shows up on the emerging growth list. If you look at it, the last time it showed up on emerging growth was back in May of this year. Very strong numbers, you know, relative strength rank of 98. Uh, very good growth metrics as well. Smaller cap name. But look at that chart. Every time Abiomed goes on a run, it gets slammed lower every single time. You can't even call that a roller coaster. I mean, that's just whiplash. So even though the numbers may look good, and even if the story sounds good to you, the fundamental story, given the history of this stock that just recurs over and over again, it's probably better just to pass on this one. That's just my opinion with these. They almost never turn out to be profitable positions. Here's another example. This is the Coinstar. They changed the name to Outerwall recently. Um, this is a stock I've hated for years and years and years. Every now and then it turns up on the emerging growth list as well. Um, last time it did, I think, was back in April of 2012, which is when this chart goes up to. Again, good numbers, good, good relative strength. But if you look at the history, uh, you're going to get slammed on this one if you buy it after it starts running. So just avoid it. So just to review the concepts here, so Briefing.com uses a smoothed version of relative strength in all of our systems. Um, for technical traders, you just keep it simple. Trade with the trends. You know, look to be long, high relative strength stocks, short, low relative strength stocks. Do not short high relative strength stocks unless you really know what you're doing. Um, and relative strength is an essential tool for a fundamentally inclined investor. Um, I've already explained that several times. And a key concept here, again, is to interpret relative strength in the context of the market. You, you can't just say because a stock has a 99 relative strength that it's a good buy, that it's a good buy candidate. Um, it's not. You have to, it, it's good to focus on the current leaders in a bull market, but you really need to evaluate the chart and determine how early stage that idea is. And if you're looking out for potential future leaders that have better than average relative strength, but, but they're not leaders yet, uh, you want to look for a particular chart pattern, which I described earlier, the, side, you know, the sideways range on a weekly chart bumping up against the upper end. And you really want to make sure that the fundamental story checks out and that it could be a, that it turn, that it's more of a high conviction idea so that it's worth your time really tracking that one. In a bear market, just focus on the leaders. Uh, the current leaders in a bear market with a relative strength rank above 90 are also going to be your future leaders. I know that's a generalization. There will be some exceptions to that. But any stock that's showing relative strength in the 90s while the broad market is selling off over an extended period is going to be one of the first ones to break out when that correction ends. And finally, uh, as to where you can find these types of lists, uh, current market leaders can be found in the emerging growth stocks rankings every Monday. And again, uh, these are at the, BIP, uh, the briefing in play plus level. Uh, I personally screen for both current and future uh, growth stock leaders, so really anything with a relative strength above 50 along with the fundamental criteria. And I'll often post my watch list under the growth trader uh, handle. Uh, swing trading ideas. Uh, the liquid momentum system is specifically designed to isolate those. And value ideas can be found in the value leaders. 
system, which is posted uh, every Wednesday morning. So that leaves us some time for the Q&A. So if you would just give me a brief moment, I'll, uh, I'll just look at the questions and uh, we'll start it. Uh, number number one, right off the bat, the question is, is this webinar recorded? Yes, it is. Uh, the replay will be available sometime tomorrow morning. Uh, I'll post a comment on the in-play service letting you know that it's there, and it'll take you to our briefing.com YouTube channel. Uh, so yes, it will be available. And this question comes up fairly frequently. Does briefing maintain any list of potential shorts? Um, the short answer to that is no, because they're more difficult to screen for, I think, to be perfectly honest. Um, we post, uh, particularly at the trader level of service, plenty of short candidates. I know that on the liquid momentum uh, feature at the InPlay Plus level, the lead analyst there will often, if he sees a high relative strength stock that seems to be sort of sputtering out, uh, he'll often flag it as uh, a short candidate. But we don't have any formal lists for short ideas. Uh, another question is, uh, why do you put names on emerging growth that you don't like? <laughs> it's actually a good question. Um, the emerging growth rankings are purely quantitative. so. They're generated every week just based on a purely quantitative system, and they are what they are. So, and that's really intentional. We wanted to remove the emotion and the bias from it, and we wanted to just generate these high relative strength ideas as is. But when we post our commentary on them, we try and make it pretty clear whether we like the story or are just lukewarm on it. Lukewarm on it. Um, Someone asked if I could recap the smoothed RS calculation again. Sure, that's really easy. Basically, all you're doing is you're comparing the stock's current price with the current value of its 26-week simple moving average. So you're just measuring the distance between the two. And then you're comparing that stock to every other stock in the All Stocks universe and just ranking them from 1 to 100. Someone asked, is it best to compare stocks to sectors or its relevant indexes or something else? Uh, that's, that's a very complicated question. And to be perfectly honest, um, I, I just simply don't do it that way. I, I look at things on sort of an absolute basis uh, in that sense. I mean, or maybe a better way of putting it is I don't evaluate stocks relative to their sector. I know that there's very good reasons to do so and when you're kind of looking at fundamentals. And, and when I look at the fundamentals, I will compare it to other names in their group. But when it comes to relative strength, no, I don't. I just look at the high relative strength stocks. And often you'll see a pattern. You know, there are a lot of tech stocks or there are a lot of biotechs or a lot of housing stocks. Um, but um, I, don't, I don't break it down or do any weightings when it comes to sectors or groups. So one question is, other than, uh, I'm assuming that's earnings, um, other than earnings, what typically causes a sizable change in rankings in the emerging growth list? Um, that is, is actually a really good question. I would say that during earnings season is when we have the most turnover in our list. And that's pretty typical year in and year out because, again, the emerging growth list is not only based on relative strength, it's based on fundamental criteria, and obviously those fundamental criteria refresh during the quarter. But what I would say to that is when you do see, say, a whole lot of turnover in the emerging growth list, it's actually a really good sort of tell for the market, I think. Uh, we tend to see, say, after a long run in the market, when you start to see a lot of churn in emerging growth, that's usually reflective that 
there's some kind of um, rotation going on, um, and, and the market itself is churning. And it's not always reflected if you're just looking at the S&P um, index. You know, the S&P index might still be rallying, but the real leading stocks are churning. Um, I, that's actually a really good tell for the market. Uh, I've commented on that before. Uh, if you'd like more of an explanation, feel free to shoot me an email. Actually, I'll go to the next slide. Um, if you have any further questions about that or would like to discuss something in more detail, there's my personal email address there, by the way. Um, and also, if you'd like to check out any of the features that I mentioned, say emerging growth or liquid momentum or the value, uh, the value leaders service, you can um, sign up for a trial by going to the web, the website there. Just go to briefing.com, and you'll see you'll be able to find your way to take a trial. Or you could just shoot an email to sales at briefing.com. Someone asked. Um, what valuation criteria are on the emerging growth stocks list. This is moving a little bit further away from the relative strength topping, but it, the question comes up a fair amount. Um, there aren't any. That's the short answer. Re uh, emerging growth is based on growth criteria, as the name implies. Revenue growth, earnings growth, uh, a few other fundamental criteria, and relative strength. And there is intentionally no valuation criteria for that. That's not what we're looking for. And uh, unless there are any further questions, that might, uh, that might be it. So if you have any more questions, uh, put them in the chat right now. Otherwise, we'll probably wrap it up. All right, well, that will do it. So if you have any further questions, please just send them to my email address on the screen there, jbush at briefing.com. Um, or if you'd like to take a free trial of the service, just go to the briefing.com website. You'll find the trial. All of the things that I mentioned tonight are at the InPlay Plus level, but we also have a higher level, again, the briefing trader service. Um, so a bunch of different ways that you can uh, check out the service uh, by going to the website. And uh, we'll call it a night. So thank you so much for listening to the webinar, and um, hope to see you again soon. Thank you.